Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome back to a long overdue video. Uh, I think the wounds of our last debate just took so long to heal that, um, yeah, it, it's taken us, David just said, like over a year to uh, record a new one, which is crazy. Um, but we are back for a joint Bond film discussion, and I'm here, of course, with Mr. Bond Experience himself, David Zaritsky. How are you, David? I'm doing great. Thank you ha for having me back on. It, it, you, like you said, it took a year to uh, sign all the prenups <laughs> and the contracts, um, the do not resuscitates, all that stuff. And we're back. Yeah, I know. God. And, 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 and we're back talking about a film uh, that, you know, we were posting on Instagram that we were both, you know, watching Diamonds Are Forever in preparation for this. And so I got some messages from people being like, Oh, you know, oh, you know, um, which one of you is going to be in the because, you know, often one of us is more the fan than the other. We have like a bit of a for and against thing going on. Um, and I was saying, like, you know what? Actually, I I think we're pr going to be pretty um, level on this one, really. I feel like we're in the films now where we don't really, you know, we, we often find ourselves agreeing with each other. But then just before we recorded, I went back to your 25 Bond film ranking from a couple of years ago, and you placed Diamonds Are Forever 21 in a 25 film ranking. And if I were looking at my ranking, not counting Never Say Never Again, Casino Royale, Diamonds yeah. comes 16 out of 25. Ooh. So that's a that's a okay. good bit of difference there. I think we might actually, uh, yeah, we might differ on a few things with this one. That's true, because it's usually, I mean, at least in recent times, it's not overtly black and white where you have mm. this, you know, debate scenario going on here. But I was curious about this one coming into it, because as I was even setting up, like, I'll give you a perfect example. I got so organized for this one. I, I actually, I have notes. So I took notes and inside I've got my notes. And I mean, there's a lot going on in this film. And oh. I approached it differently because I had a feeling of the lean that you would take. So I said, you know something, just David, go in here, even how you ranked it before, just wipe it all off of you. Get the grum and everything off of you and just... Go in there and just say you're going to have fun and have this new attitude. Because I don't know about you, but especially since it's been such a drought, you call it a drought, which is mm. genius. It's such a drought that watching a Bond film, any Bond film now, in its entirety, without little snippets, but literally beginning to end, is such a treat and pleasure. Mm. It gives me so much joy that I thought to myself, there's no way I could be grizzled about this film. And I won't spoil how I felt about it, but that's kind of the attitude I went into it. But how, how did you set yourself up for watching this film again? This is crazy. Like, I, I just need to say for people watching, we didn't like have this discussion beforehand about how we were approaching the film, but you articulated just exactly how I was feeling coming into it. This is the first Bond film that I've watched, you know, start to finish. In, in about two months time, something like that, it occurred to me that like, oh, you're right. Yeah, no, I think early December... Um, I watched one and then over it's been Christmas, so like had a holiday and, you know, works busy and stuff. And I, I did sit down to watch this one again with a martini in hand. I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to Friday night entertainment, just go all out with it. Uh, so that's really interesting because I also just sat down for this one, just being like, you know what, I just want to switch my brain off, be entertained and have fun with this. That's so interesting that you had exactly the same philosophy. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm curious to see if that whole concept and, and, and as your audience is watching this, this whole concept of the Bond film, your reaction to a Bond film is directly proportional to your perception, you know, how you're setting yourself up. Uh, going into it like it's very much that if you're going to a, a world premiere and you're sitting at a world premiere is the movie enjoyment heightened all because of that and then six months later you watch that same film and you're like what was I thinking on the red carpet but yeah. I, I, this will be curious then well, I, I would like, you know, I always like to start these off by talking a little bit about uh, memories of, you know, first seeing the film and when we first came to it. Uh, for me, this was the second Bond film that I ever saw. So it does have a bit of a semi special place in my heart. It was this and Moonraker were the two for that got me into Bond, which explains so much about what I like about this series, the things that I gravitate towards. Uh, do you have any memories of when you first came to it? Well, okay. So when this came out in 1971, 
This will show the age difference here, and this is where people <laughs> sign off, um, because I'm 56 now. I was three years old. It's 1971. I was three years old. I was born in 68. Um, so I didn't see this clearly um, when it first came out. But like you, this is the second Bond film I ever saw. And I'll tell you why. First one was in Atlantic City. It's raining. And my father brought me, because it was raining. You don't go on the beach in Atlantic City when it's raining, to this crazy film with this guy with metal teeth and sharks and this very suave looking guy that kind of looked like my dad. And that was The Spy Who Loved Me. And I fell in love with that. And I remember my father saying, well, there's, there's a bunch of other films. Cut to, I don't know how much in the future, but there was a, a, a showing of Diamonds Are Forever on TV. And my father's like, get in here, get in here. This is like another one of those films. Well, it was a different guy. It was obviously <laughs> a very different tone than The Spy Who Loved Me, but it is the second film. So I remember seeing it with my father. And I certainly, as a very, very, very young man, um, you know, maybe I was eight or nine when I saw it. Um, I certainly don't remember any faults with it whatsoever. <laughs> I don't even remember saying to myself, that's a different James Bond. I just remember having an absolute ball watching it as a child. That is fascinating. I don't know if we've ever discussed this before. I can't believe it's both of our second Bond films that we saw, because I was also probably about nine years old, I think, when I saw it. And, yeah. you know, obviously we must have liked it well enough because we kept on watching them. It <laughs> didn't, you know, put either and of us off. And it's a perfect nine-year-old film. I mean, not to get into the details, but it's not overtly violent, I don't think, in any way. I mean, it's got that kind of PG-ish you know, type of violence. I wouldn't say it's overly sexual innuendos. And those innuendos, just like Bugs Bunny cartoons, would fly over a nine-year-old's head anyway. Yeah, but yeah. it's so daffy and crazy and visual. I mean, it is a visual buffet, like at a Las Vegas buffet of all you can eat for $5, that as a <laughs> child, you're just gobbling it all up. You know, I, I quite agree with that, actually. Even for all of its, because, you know, watching it this time, We'll get into it. We're going to talk about the story in a little bit. But, you know, it's a bit of a complicated plot, this one. I think it might be one of the more complicated Bond plots to follow. But as a kid, I suppose it just washes over you completely and you're just you're just rolling yeah. with it. It's funny you say complicated because I do want to get into the complication of things. Mm. Being a marketing guy, I put a title on my notes and it says Diamonds Are Forever. Uneven Camp Fun. So the tagline for me in my head watching this was it's uneven camp fun and the complication of the story and how the characters support each other or connect to each other or who's zooming who I think was very uneven, mm. but so many things were. Yeah. Oh, OK. You know, what? let's get into this then. Yeah, we're <laughs> let's talk everybody. about. Yeah, <laughs> let's, you know, start at the beginning, uh, the opening sequence. Uh, and I specifically want to ask you, like, how you feel about because a lot I know that a lot of people's disappointment with Diamonds Are Forever stems from the fact that it is not the gritty revenge thriller following on from the end of Majesty's Secret Service, where obviously Bond's wife is killed. And you know what? I don't think that these films make a good double bill. You know, I, I don't recommend watching those two films back to back. Um, I, I'm because I saw Diamond so early, I never had any expectation that it would be, you know, um, a, a gritty revenge thriller following on from Majesty's. Um, in retrospect, does it bother you that the film isn't that and that it kind of tries to wrap up all of the Majesty's baggage in that opening sequence by just having Bond kill Blofeld, like, you know, immediately, pretty much? Okay, so I was much, 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 much older, like in the last few years, where I realized that that pre-title sequence was actually trying to wrap up that whole mm. thing and put a bow on it for those that remembered on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Because, mm. you know, now that we're bond historians we know it didn't do an overwhelming job at the box office so mm -hmm. they weren't going to be apologetic about that they wanted to move on as quickly as possible this time around i did see it with those eyes of like let me let me just see how they wrap it up mm -hmm. my problem with it is and here i go with my tagline it's so uneven um mm -hmm. there's dubbing issues that are so distracting you know here i'm coming from honor majesty's secret service which is a visual uh, writing, e even some of the acting in it, you know, maybe not Lazenby, but some of the other 
uh, actors, just absolute tempanade, like it's this high level peak of, of, of Shakespearean acting, quite frankly. And then you've got this weird unevenness with Kai, 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 you know, it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, just all of this is so strange and the backwards forward editing. And even when you see Connery, there's this weird editing, which I know you've explored in the trailers, you hear his actual voice for some strange reason, they edit it again, and it's so obvious to me. My name is Bond, James Bond. My name is Bond, James Bond. So I couldn't, I couldn't get away as much as I tried to go into this saying, just enjoy it, relax. <laughs> I couldn't get away from the technical issues and also the fact that this didn't seem like the same Bond. You know, here you had Bond at the end of Honor Majesty's Secret Service cradling his dead wife. And then all of a sudden you've got this, I shan't ask again nicely. You know, da 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 And I just, it did not seem like the same guy to me. So it was awkward mm. and it was uneven. How did you mm. feel about it? Uh, similar, like as, as a, uh, you know, an opening to diamonds in a, you know, in a vacuum, it, fine. Okay. It's, uh, it, it's in keeping with the era following on from Majesty's Secret Service. You can't help but be slightly disappointed that this is the path they decided to take. I do think that they tried to have their cake and eat it too. Like, yes, he is like going after Blofeld. If you notice the first shot of the film, it opens in Japan, well, or it's insinuated that it's Japan, I guess, um, which is obviously You Only Live Twice, where that was set. So you could, in your own head canon, if you wanted to take yeah. out Majesties from the continuity, you could kind of just insinuate that it's following on immediately from the end of You Only Live Twice. Right. Um, I don't know if they put that much thought into it back in the day when continuity wasn't much of a much of an issue um but yes uh the action's pretty lackluster as well i have to say there is a clunkiness to the bit where uh he's fighting blofeld and blofeld like lunges at him with the sword and that with the machete and then he pulls the thing and you can just see the actors are just waiting for their cues to like you know he he's going to release the machete he's going to like just stay there perfectly yeah. still uh there is a stiltedness to it that makes it a bit awkward did you find that stiltedness throughout the film? I, there's this weird mm. action thing going on in this film, and I hit it on this time for the first time, where, like, even when he's throwing the little scalpels into the guy, and it's like, it hits him, and then the guy goes, ooh! And <laughs> again, Charles Gray, it's like, you know, he pulls it down, and it's like this weird, like, stop, and then react. And yeah. then when he gets shot in the head with the grappling gun, there's this weird, like, ah! And then the scorpion. <laughs> The guy gets the scorpion down oh, the back. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, like, everything has this weird pause. Like, you know, they're dumbing it down for the audience. I don't know what, what went on. It's so interesting that you bring that up. Because, yeah, even in uh, when the satellite is, you know, blowing things up and you have that one, I, I, uh, I think it's uh, in China, isn't it? And he, like, looks up and then, ah! And then, you know, every, everyone loves that bit. It's so funny. Uh, but you're, you're really right. Um, it... it I, I don't mind the one where the uh, climbing hook goes in his head because I kind of like that. I, I think it works in the moment yeah. that he's sort of like standing up, thinking like, "Oh wait, this is this is okay." Oh no, it isn't. I'm dying, kind of thing. Um, he's like but, a shot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I, I I agree. I think it does set you up for the fact that this film is not going to be an action thrill ride, like I think Majesties was. I think that film has some phenomenal action in it. I, yeah. This one, even the car chase in Vegas, I think is a little stilted is the word, word that I gravitate towards. But then I, I think I'm going to make the case throughout this video that Diamonds is not really a, you know, a, a James Bond spy thriller adventure like so many of the others are. I think it's probably the best James Bond comedy. Uh, I think it's certainly funnier and uh, more deserving of that moniker than the Casino Royale spoof anyway. But I do think that it is a film that if you come into it with the expectation of this is a comedy, you will enjoy it more. Do you agree? Yeah. I think I, th I do. And and since, you know, we'll finish the kind of the flavor of Honor Majesty Secret Service, I think this was an overcorrection. Mm. And I'll call it an overcorrection. We could debate that rather than just a correction of, gosh, Honor Majesty Secret Service was so serious. It was so spy and revenge and death. 
And now we've got to overcorrect it because after all, it's the 70s, it's crazy time, it's Austin Powers, it's all these things. So I feel like if you go into it knowing that this is an overcorrection, because many people, this is not me coining this, I'm stealing this from others. Many people have said, if you look at Honor Majesty Secret Service and then Diamonds Are Forever together, especially back to back, it looks like there's a major jump in an error of quality and mm. of tone to the mm. Bond film. It's like, you know, very serious and then absolute camp zaniness. And so I think you need to like almost reassert and dial yourself differently to enjoy this film. I quite agree. And I think that there are, you know, sometimes there are films that you can see in a certain mindset and then you come back to it with another perspective. I think Starship Troopers is a really good example. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Like, I don't know if that necessarily Loved works. It. Is it? Right. Yeah. No, I, Robin, I, really I used love to it. collect the armor and the screen use stuff. I had the guns. I had a bug leg on my office wall, full size bug leg from the movie. There are no pictures idea. on the internet. If you look up David Zeritsky, Starship Troopers of me cosplaying at conventions uh, as uh, as the characters from the film with my good friends. I had no idea that. Oh yeah. That, wow. Okay. I love that film. <laughs> That's amazing. I know. Yeah. I I love it too. But like you you know the the elements of it that are you know satirical that yeah. are sort of commenting on you know the state of fashion. You know I know people who've come out of it and you know said like oh it's a really you know awful like pro military pro fascist film and it's like no 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 it's it's the opposite of that it's actually it. very yeah. satirical and you know showgirls is another film i think also by the same director actually um yeah i don't have any props and i didn't dress up in those clothes <laughs> yeah. uh, i mean I, I i yeah it would have been uh pretty amazing if you were like oh yeah no i got i got the the pole yeah. from the pole dancing the scenes. <laughs> yeah. yeah um all right, so let let's uh, let's uh, move on to a different topic now. I think um, we, we touched on it briefly. Um, Connery being back, and obviously he's very much showcased in these opening scenes. It's like, don't don't worry, don't worry. The Australian guy is gone. He's he's no more. We've brought back the the real James Bond for audiences of the time. Uh, I know that. I think we, when we talked about this in um, our You Only Live Twice uh, discussion as well about, you know, and it's talked about quite a lot, Connery seemed, you know, he was a bit, you know, disinterested, disenfranchised yeah. on that film. Um, for me, Diamonds, he's like back on, you know, really good form again. This is sort of like the Connery with the twinkle in his eye that I really like in uh, Goldfinger and Thunderball. Um, do you feel that way as well? Because I know some people still feel like there is a bit of a sort of a slightly bored <laughs> um, element to his performance here. Oh, I, I I don't get that at all. I, I do have a conflicted view of Connery in this movie. It it It's probably not as one sided as maybe you. But so the conflict is I don't think he looks good. I think, you know, he's at mm. his dad bod extreme. I think he got a little lazy in that regard. And even the way he holds himself. It's very interesting. If you take a look at Thunderball, the way he holds himself when he sits, just from a, a positioning standpoint, he's got his shoulders back, very tall, very, you know, boom. He's a little crow magnum in this. He's very like, you know, slumping his shoulders. And he wasn't he wasn't even that old. He was, you know, 10 years younger than I am now. And yet he looks older than me. And a lot of that was the way his body was, but the way he was also holding himself and the gait. I will say this. The 70s doesn't help. I remember the 70s very well. The 70s was not about combing your hair. And it wasn't <laughs> about high fashion. Um, it had its own style, but it wasn't about really being kept. So somebody like that almost was a superhero body back then because you didn't have the Schwarzeneggers and the, certainly the Daniel Craigs. That being said, right from the very beginning in the pre-title sequence, you know, even when the, the guy goes, hands up, and he goes like, <laughs> you know, he's got this like little flippant, like, you know, go for it. I'm prepared. It's so Connery. And I know you love these scenes, but there are so many very Bond moments, like the exposition scene when they're talking about the diamond smuggling, which I I could watch. This is going to sound so strange to people. I could watch two hours of exposition Bond things lined up. I love those moments because they're so Fleming. But even Connery's reaction and the glibness and the snarkiness to M is so perfectly Connery that, yes, I loved it so much more than uh, the previous films we all 
I love the whole thing with the sherry and the during the briefing scene where he's showing M up, but with the, with the whole vintage date thing, and it's yeah, no, it's really nice. It's so funny that you brought up the posture thing because that occurred to me, and I don't think I've ever really considered it, but just like when you see him in, you know, from a shrivel of Goldfinger, he's he moves like a panther. There's a, a just a, a certain way that he moves that is so magnetic and interesting, and that's all really gone here. And I think he gets it back in like later films, like in The Rock. I think he, you know, he really looks um like like a, a tough action hero in that film. So I don't know if he, you know had classes <laughs> he you know i i don't know how he did it but uh yeah no, in no, this film like, particularly stands out yeah he's kind of like i don't want to say sulking but he's just kind of moving through things left and right which is crazy because if i think about it, it's the same director who directed goldfinger and goldfinger he's just like proud strong you know that's kind of the epitome of the connery bond in that film so mm. it's a strange miss for me mm. I, I was curious, actually, we, we can talk about this now, about the, the Bond style, uh, you know, in, in this film. Because I know that it's, uh, like you say, it's the 70s. Uh, you know, I, I, it might be more of a, you know, an, an acquired taste, I guess, some of the uh, the fashion choices in this. Uh, how do you rate this one overall? Do you have a, you must have a pink tie. You must have that pink tie. I don't have a pink tie. And I promised uh, Chris from... Uh, uh, British Bond British addict. Bond addict, yes. Yeah, that I wouldn't I wouldn't trounce the tie. I promised it. So I want to keep that promise. And and actually, as I watched it this time, I thought to myself, that is very typical of the 70s. You know, the shorter tie, you know, the kind of small up here and then majorly fat, the giant lapels. So I, I, I'm having trouble dinging the fashion of this because it is a sign of the times. Now, if, if somebody appeared today in the type of sack suits, that's what we call those suits. They're kind of like sack suits because they they kind of just drape on you. You know, mm. in this movie, the suits wore Bond. Bond didn't wear the suits. Mm. He didn't, I didn't feel like he owned the suits. A part of that was his body and mm. a part of that was the tailoring. But it, like I'm wearing right now an all of our brown, the shirt from the very beginning mm. that he wears. And I like the more casual moments that he has. I thought this very fit the safari kind of look. I'm wearing, he wears actually um, the same exact Grun watch. It's a very simple watch. It's not a Rolex. It's not an Omega. It's not a Casio. It's not a Seiko. It's just, it's a Grun watch. It's not mm. expensive and it's simple. And it shows a little bit of the fact, and this is a fact about the seventies that people didn't very consciously go to their closets and go, what am I going to look like today? I mean, some mm. people, of course, but men typically didn't. I mean, all the Mad Men stuff was like almost like a uniform that people had. And in this film, I feel like you sort of had style and fashion of Bond as a way in the background mm. versus some of the movies was like, you know, Goldfinger, for example. Oh, my gosh, that three piece suit could be a star on its own. It could have received credit right under Honor Blackman, you know, as the credits roll. <laughs> Style in this was very much a background and almost a study of the times. But as a, as a non-style person, this is not your main focus, were you like vomiting in your mouth over it or were you appreciative <laughs> of it? Uh, maybe somewhere in between. <laughs> maybe maybe okay. a little bit of dry, dry heaving. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, it, it, to, to me, it's very just of the time, I guess. Like, you know, I noticed that, you know, his suits were very, um, as you said, like hanging off of him. They weren't terribly uh, form-fitting. The pink tie, I just associate with, you know, Chris from British Bond Addicts. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, it, funny that you brought him up as well. Um, so, so, yeah, there was nothing really in this that really stood out to me anyway i was interested that you know he never bond never really wears like a stealth suit or anything like that in this one like he did in goldfinger or whatever he's he's wearing a lot of suits even when he's going about his you know when he's climbing to the top of the um the building and everything and i do wonder if a part of that was uh you know, maybe a conscious thing to try to make Connery look a bit more formal or, you know, you're more like James Bond. I, I, I don't really know. Maybe he wouldn't have looked so good in a stealth suit at this it's time. It's dialing up, I think, that you and I were talking about of the fun in camp. Putting mm. Bond in a tuxedo in the 70s in a casino where nobody else is wearing a tuxedo. <laughs> it's the most standout thing in the world. It's why we sort of giggle at, you know, people like me and, you know, cosplayers who will wear a tuxedo 
in in a in a casino where everybody's wearing like jorts, you know, jean shorts, <laughs> um, and and Van Halen shirts. I think that was part of the dialing up. And then you have them rappelling off of the side of the building. It's outlandish. And I, I think that's what you have to accept about this film is that you're going to take a very, I mean, we're going to get to the moon bug in a second. Yeah. It's a very outlandish ride. So it's not going to be from Russia with love. It's not going to be this serious thing. And you have to set that expectation. But I, I will say this, the style for me was neither offensive nor appreciative. Mm. I'm not going to sit there and try to build an outfit around it. But here I am wearing this and all of our brown kicked this off. And this this thing sold out like I think they they did five runs of this shirt oh, wow. because people loved that that look in the film. And they yeah. love that safari kind of relaxed Connery look. So who are we to say what's what works? Are those the only shots in the film where he wears it as well when he goes up to the woman and strangles her with a bra? Or is it? Yeah, that's that's the only bit, isn't it? That's uh... it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's incredible because I do think of that as something of a definitive look of this film. Uh, and it never really occurred to me before that, oh yeah, actually it is only in like three shots, four shots, yeah. something like that. That's that crazy. Mm. Yeah. Um, we talked a bit there about the uh, the briefing scene, the exposition scene early on where Bond kind of gets his mission. We learn a bit about diamonds and all that. Um, this film, for, just moving on to talking about the plot a bit more broadly, because uh, the first half of this film, it, we are really just following Bond following the trail of these diamond smugglers and following, okay, so these diamonds pass through people. We see them get bumped off by a couple of henchmen characters who we're definitely going to talk about soon. I can't wait to talk about Winton Kidd. Um, it, it, it's an interesting briefing scene in that, and I remember being a little bit confused by what was happening as a kid because we have the briefing scene with Bond, M and the diamond expert, and it's intercut with these scenes of Winton Kidd traveling around the world, basically bumping off people People who are passing these diamonds through um, this chain, which is an interesting thing to do, because unless that briefing scene is taking place over the course of like three days or something, and Bond and Emma just trapped in this room, it's very um, uh, non-linear non -linear in its yeah. editing, if you know what I mean, which is uh, an interesting choice. Uh, mm. I do think it's interesting that this is the first Bond film, unless he did some uncredited work on it, uh, that Peter Hunt isn't involved with in any capacity, and his editing was often was uh, of course very influential with some of the earlier Bonds. He directed Majesty's Secret Service, um, and I do wonder if he was still in the editing room. All of this exposition stuff, this briefing stuff, would have been different. Um, mm. Like maybe we would have just followed Winton Kidd in their own little adventure and then had the briefing scene, it would it would be quite interesting. But I do think that it is a lot of information to take in. We see where we're introduced to an awful lot of people that are bumped off in a variety of ways. You're not quite sure who to follow. Um, it, it just, you know, we talked a little bit about the plot earlier on. How do you find the plot in this film broadly? Because I do, it, it, it's quite a complicated plot, yeah. I think, uh, to follow with an awful lot of characters that we meet throughout it. I lost the plot trying to follow the plot because, well, and you said something really important. You said, you know, as, as, as a child, especially, you know, and I would go one step further and say 1970s audiences, um, and I count myself amongst them at the time, they were not as complicated as mm. wonderfully complicated as we are today and, and understanding like you've got to pay attention and oh i see how things are coming and forecasting what's going to come or should come in a film so i can't um, i can only imagine how convoluted it was back then because even in this viewing i came away thinking all right here's what i don't understand with the plot who is working for who who's connected mm. I mean, you know, Shady Tree um, and Winton Kidd, are they connected or Winton Kidd connected to Blofeld? And and how do they connect to uh, Tiffany Case and Tiffany Case's with those henchmen and the other bad guys? And, you know, I didn't even know there was a pool. Like, all right, so <laughs> they're connected with Tiffany Case. But then where are Winton Kidd with this? There's there's four groups of bad guys and I don't know where they swim together. And that's the unevenness that I'm talking about. It's very uneven in knowing what the motivations are for each group and each bad guy. And why did they kill Mrs. Whistler? Like, mm -hmm. okay, so they're delivering all this stuff. Why are they killing each person? You know, the, the dentist with the, the I, I just, the motivations were so confusing to me that it was hard to ribbon them together. 
This was something that I, I had to have a good long hard think about. And bearing in mind, I was two martinis deep by the time I finished watching this film last night. So I was like, yeah, why were they killing everyone off? Because uh, surely that draws more suspicion to what is going on. I can only assume that Wint and Kid are working for Blofeld to effectively eliminate the diamond smuggling chain. So Blofeld has been smuggling diamonds for his diamond satellite. So th okay. they're all on this trail over to Vegas, basically. Um, quite why he has to go South Africa to Amsterdam to Vegas rather than just going straight to Vegas. We won't get into it. So Wint and Kid are essentially cleaning house and they are tidying, uh, uh, deleting the chain, I guess. I guess. Yeah. Uh, why? I don't who's know. Who's Shady Tree working for? Shady Tree is a part of the diamond smuggling ring. So he is, yeah. So Which he is the funeral director. I, I guess. So you've got really three factions, because then now who does Tiffany Case work for? I think that she's a part of the same chain. What I don't understand is like, was, did Blofeld set up this chain? Or was this like a Willard White diamond smuggling ring that Blofeld has now infiltrated and he's using it for his own villainous schemes and Winton Kid work for him and they're just tidying up? It's, yeah. Is it a fool's errand to try to make sense of this? Probably. As you say, I don't think audiences at the time would have cared much. To this be is editing. It's not just plot. Like if you mm. connect this together in not even better exposition, but rolling out in a more thoughtful way, mm. they don't need to explain it, but they need to show it a little bit. Um, and maybe that also gets back to, you know, which we're not going to talk about the characters yet, but the plot in how it incorporates the characters. Like I think how... Mm. I follow Tiffany Case. If I was to say this is not a Bond movie, it's a Tiffany Case production. Mm. Uh, and I tried to follow the three different Tiffany Cases I see in this film, and there are three. Um, <laughs> I just, I, it would be hard to weave her within the plot other than she winds up being a, a damsel in distress. But we'll get to that. Yeah. Well, well let's talk about the characters. Let's talk about oh. Winton Kidd first uh these are two of my absolute favorite henchmen i think for a lot of people actually even though i know a lot of people don't much care for this film i think winton and kid are a highlight for a lot of people they're really creepy <laughs> that the, the, the actors are really good they're very memorable um they're characters that i've always loved even though i don't know if they'd be troubling my top 10 best bond henchmen you know ranking anytime soon how do you feel about them oh i i think they're iconic I think yeah. and, and I love them and I think they're iconic. Meaning if I saw a picture 20 yards away of Winton Kidd, I'd be like, oh. you know, my heart would just <laughs> soar in a positive way uh, because they, they are fun and memorable. And I can almost imagine them, hear me out, hear me out. I can almost imagine them in a more serious movie as mm. the deflation of seriousness. When you have a little bit of, little bit of humor and a little bit of satire, because part of their maniacal nature are the one-liners. Part of mm. their maniacal nature is being funny and, and self-deprecating sometimes and, you know, playing off of each other. And, you know, the fact that they're sort of lovers, but they're also, um, you know, work buddies as well. It's like, <laughs> you know, there's so much going on. And I think, um, Kid especially gets a lot of grief because of the way he looks, because, you know, he acts like a regular person. I love the yin and yang of the characterization of these two that, you know, this person feels like it's a coworker fixing the copier at work, whereas this one does seem like a mastermind. He's like, you know, it's like Pinky and the Brain, you know, it's like it's <laughs> the best duos that, you know, so every scene that they're in is absolute candy in fact i have to tell you this time around and i've seen it so many times this film but as i was watching i was really sort of like oh you know if somebody was with me of which they were i, I would have been like hitting them like oh yeah here's the winton kid part it's coming up it's coming up there it is <laughs> yeah, i will tell you winton kid i literally <gasps> child was brought up because of those two thinking that scorpions as soon as they bite you you die <laughs> so up until I was much older and found out it's 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 slow, it's painful, you can get sick, you hardly ever die. The smaller the scorpion, the better. Giant ones like this won't even hurt you really. They'll yeah. just give you this thing. Like, but growing up until my late forties, I thought because of that movie, if you did this, <laughs> immediately you were going to die, and that's because of Winton Kid. <laughs> Have you? 
you seen that deleted uh, footage, the alternate take where they put it in his mouth and yes, closes back? Ooh. It's so I know watching that, it's like it's really shocking. It's, yeah, yeah, that really would have been over the top, but I would have loved that too. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, but it's you love worth... the characters, obviously. I love them, absolutely yeah. love them. They're some of my yeah favorite Bond characters. It, it's worth saying here as well that this is <laughs> this one's a very loose adaptation of the book. There are um. Winton Winton Kid do exist in the Fleming novel, but they're very different. They're much more, uh, you know. I think they are still a couple, but they're like really like hardened like mafia men kind of thing. Here, they went a completely different way with it. I think it's interesting. Um, you know, Putter Smith, like he, you know, plays Mister Kid. He's not even an actor. He was a musician yeah. that I think Guy Hamilton saw and just thought, like, oh yeah, you've got a good look for this. So I, I think it's entirely sort of casting driven that they have the personalities that they do. Um, yeah. but and Mankiewicz's is writing too. I think Mankiewicz, oh, yeah. because he started his like reign of writing, if you will, mm. just typically writes like that. Even in like some of the Superman movies, it's like he's got this kind of sardonic view of like, you know, Otis, you know, from yeah. Superman, like these type of kind of whimsical characters that again, deflate the seriousness of things. Oh, totally. I think that this, like the dialogue in, is some of the best in all of Bond. I think that there is so much wittiness and it's camp. Like I think, David, have you ever seen a pantomime, a, a classic sort of a British pantomime show? Have you ever you been mean, to like one? literally like? No, no, no. Like, uh, you know, like, um, uh, Dick Whittington, Puss in Boots, uh, you know, on a stage. Because uh, no. this film, to me, it's very interesting. Tom Mankiewicz is an American writer, but so much about this film reminded me of the, a pantomime, which is this, oh. you know, it's it's like a British thing. It's often around Christmas time that they do a fairy tale. Um, there's often a widow twanky character. There's a bloke dressed up as a woman coming on. And um, they're, they're often, even though they're made for kids, for family audiences, they're full of innuendo. Um, there's oh. lots of nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And there's a slight element to them of, look, we all know who are performing this that this is a little bit, you know, shit, <laughs> like what we're yeah. doing, but we're just going to roll with it. We're going to have fun. We're just going to get through it. And Diamonds Are Forever is kind of that to me in a lot of ways. It's like, I feel like it's it's constantly winking at you and nudging the audience to be like, yeah, we, we, we know that this is all a little bit complicated and strange and weird, but let's just have fun and roll with it. And um, I think if you're willing to roll with it, you'll have a good time with it i hope if you're laughing that's a good thing in this film yeah. um it's and, funny and you yeah. say that too because i think historically and i hate to keep saying historically what happened in the 70s but especially in the early 70s um this was a time when i think people really needed to you know come out of the whole idea of war and dourness mm. and really needed to have fun all over the world you know the united states the uk and this was sort of an answer to that. I feel like it was almost like Eon saying, you know, something we we've got to. And they were so good at this, you know, saying this is what the audience needs right now mm -hmm. in the period of time in history. This is what the audience needs right now. And we need them cheering. So we're going to have a hero, but we're going to have a lot of zaniness around there because we need to put the hero not in the most like serious of things where you're stressing and eating your fingernails, but laughing a little bit. I completely agree with you, because I think in the late 60s, you know, Easy Rider really, you know, revolutionized filmmaking in a big way in the 60s. And, you know, French Connection, uh, Planet of the Apes has a real downer of an ending. You know, there, there's a lot of grittiness, a lot of um, sort of downbeat energy to a lot of films, like films that I think are great. But, uh, you know, Bond kind of existed as, you know, throughout that era as a bit of like a, an escapist, you know, fun uh, adventure film escape really from mm -hmm. from that which uh, yeah I, I think Diamonds is that all it's over that. and I, as as you say whether you consider that an overcorrection or not from Majesty's Secret Service uh, you know but uh, but I do think that the cast here uh, really all um, you know uh, filter into that vibe really well I don't feel like there's anyone in the main cast who isn't on the camp train basically even oh, yeah. Jill St. John as Tiffany Case uh, let's move on to her because you, you made a comment there about there being three different uh, versions of that character which I don't disagree with um, I, I'm curious how you uh, siphon those three different characters out are we talking like amsterdam vegas oil rig does it change with location it does it does i, I think you've got a very um capable individual who like you said is part of a, a smuggling ring and and mm. knows how to 
you know, be sly and all these things. Very smart, I think, very smart. And, um, you know, I'll say this too, because I think she gets a little bit of grief. The clothing or clothing she doesn't wear, the clothing she wears, the clothing she doesn't wear, the lingerie, that is her using her power as a sensual woman. I don't see anything of there of being a tart or mm -hmm. being, oh, she's a typical Bond girl. She's using that in a very specific way. Um, I, I will say that it does change. She turns into this, usually about the gas station scene, she turns into this sassy creature. It's just all about being sassy and, you know, I'm going to get you and sassy, sassy. And then the third version of her, which is the most irritating, and it's, it's a Marcus Brody type of moment where she turns into, I'm sorry to say a bimbo, just as he says, dumb, you know, if those things were brains um, and, and a damsel in distress. And it's so disturbing to see this degradation of this really kind of strong character to go down this slope. Um, yeah, I wasn't a fan of her, but I, I like her. Mm. I like the actress. I like the character. I just didn't like where they took the character. The actress seems like a really good sport, like when I've seen in interviews and, you know, famously in the um, Bond Girls Are Forever documentary, they, you know, talking about the legacy of Bond Girls, like, oh, do you regret it? And all that kind of thing. And she says, oh, no, if you regret being a Bond girl, you're a fool. Like, you know, this is an amazing thing to be a part of. And she just seems like she's, you know, she wasn't like lamenting like, oh, I wish my character was doing as much as Bond and all that kind of stuff. Like she is kind of happy to play up to the to the bimbo side of things, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, which, like, I, I, even in even in those last few scenes on the oil rig, I still think she has a certain sense yeah. of uh, control. Like, I love when Bond sees her and she's just there in a bikini, like, on a sun lounger and she just, like, lowers the glasses. I, I think that's so that's lovely. The, the fact that she's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of trapped here, but I'm gonna roll with it. And she's just, like, waltzing into Blofeld's office and being like, hey, Ernst. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I do quite like that. She's also the first uh, American Bond girl, I think, isn't she? Uh, at this point in the series history, Diana Rigg, Kissy. Yeah. I just think her reactions, even like in the very last scene, um, the bomb surprise scene, yeah. when she sees it and she's like, e e <laughs> it's like, that's the reaction. All right. Well, let's yeah. go with that. <laughs> yeah, she does that. And then she runs away all of like, you know, <laughs> three feet. And then right. decides, oh, maybe I'll help. And then she like limply throws the the uh, the cake, which is yeah. But um, I've always really liked this character. I I I, I do like she has a bullshy energy, um, and again, just sort of playing into the pantomime aspect of the thing. Just this knowing sense of camp and ridiculousness about her that she understands exactly what what she's in. She knows exactly the tone and the vibe, um, and and I, and I can roll with it. How did you feel about sort of the other? So I, I can I consider her sort of an anti-hero turn hero. Um, mm. What did you think of the, some of the other hero characters, like Felix, for example? Ooh, this week? not one of the better Felixes. Uh, he, he he doesn't get given much to do though. Really, he is sort of an it, in a similar way to Goldfinger. I think this is you know a bit of a Guy Hamilton thing. Uh, I do think he likes sort of poking fun at. Americans and Americanisms and, you know, Felix being an American character, there is an element of, uh, you know, buffoonishness to him. I think we see it more in some of the sheriff characters, like Diamonds Are Forever has a sheriff um, who's not the, the quality of a sheriff pepper, but he is there. But I think that there is a bit of an element of, you know, oh, the American can't be as good as James Bond, so he needs to be a bit more... Um, you know, he he's a bit more doughy. He's a bit more sort of sluggish. Yeah. He's a bit slower on the uptake than Connery is. I feel like that's how Guy Hamilton treats Felix Leiters in his films. Um, how did you feel? I think it's one of the weakest portrayals. I think yeah. it's one of the weakest Felixes that we have. It's a bit mushy. I think the delivery is a little weak as well. It's not just mm -hmm. what he's given to do or the lines. The delivery is mm -hmm. a little stead. But I... It's interesting you're saying this too, because I'm reflecting back to the film. I always felt like Felix was like very, like not competent. Like if if the Americans are going to send one of their best people because the Brits have sent one of their best people, Felix wouldn't have been there. But <laughs> because they have that relationship, at least the way it's written in the film. Um, but then you're right. I mean, you know, even, you know, Baja, you know, the way Willard White <laughs> is written and stuff like that is this kind of hick. Um, 
you know, just I, I actually do like the flavor of Willard White. Mm. I like some of those characters and just it was curious how the Scooby gang in here is represented is is a little bit weaker as opposed to I think this film really illustrates the strength of baddies because mm. I think bad guys and gals in this like Thumper and Bambi, like Winton Kidd, like Blofeld, like the roster if a bad guy baddies in this film goes against every other film, it's just amazingly strong. And then you've got kind of these weak bad guys or good guys that come out. Even to like Mrs. Whistler and that dentist, like from the start, they've got like one scene each and they're just so interesting. And you think like, oh yeah, I could watch a whole film with them just sticking around. They're such strange types. I do agree. I I think it's it, it's an interesting um, dichotomy that, you know, they talk about a lot in the behind the scenes stuff about how Diamonds Are Forever was sort of the Americanization of Bond in a lot of ways. It's like an awful lot of it is taking place in America. They'd considered an actor, well, they signed um, an American actor, John Gavin, to play the part. Yes. like before Connery you know could be persuaded to come back so this could have been a real sort of pivot towards a more Americanized James Bond and yet I think you have a director at the helm who is just you know likes just poking fun at Americans basically which is I think why a lot of the allies that Bond has in this you know because so many of them are American they're just a bit sort of buffoonish and this isn't like you know Jack Lord from Doctor No where him and Bond you could totally see just like running into action together here it's like Felix and the CIA are these bumbling guys that like you know burst into the Bambi and Thumper house and they're sort of like scurrying around as like Keystone Cops kind of thing it's uh it's it, it's interesting yeah. um but let's move on to talking about the big bad uh, yeah. Blofeld, Charles Gray, one of my favorite uh, actors in Bond films. Uh, I, oh, I, you have a look on your face of like, oh, like, like you're going to deliver me some really like bad news now. I, I have a no, sense that I you're going to really not like him. <laughs> I think, I think so far we've been pretty close on mm. a lot of our things. I have a feeling we're going to go like this now. Oh, but maybe oh, not. And it's Charles Gray that did it. Charles Gray is the fork in our um, <laughs> opinions. As he always is. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so Blofeld. Uh, you know, here are my problems with Blofeld in this movie. There are just so many things that happen that I do not get. Mm. Uh, motivations. And, and I'm I'm fine with it, you know, philosophically, obviously, but like showing up in drag. Um, I guess he was just trying to not like to skirt the authority so he was dressing up in drag i don't know what that's the most effective thing because he's not fooling anybody um there and again i guess that's the zaniness aspect so all right i'll drink that kool-aid but just some of the motivations having all the multiples and the twins it's like that's such a complicated plot and does it really factor into the story and even his motivation of a laser doesn't seem as big and robust and worldly as some of the other previous Blofeld motivations. It's this very specific laser. I'm going to get some missiles and I'm going to get it just, I don't know. There was just something about it. And I was okay with the playfulness mm. and the banter between Bond and him because Charles Gray, you know, he's so good at that. But as a Blofeld character, really kind of, I didn't feel any kind of menace whatsoever. Um, it felt daffy. It felt stringy. It felt loose. And I actually do think it's one of the weakest Blofelds. Oh, you said all of that like it was a bad thing. <laughs> it's loose and stingy. Yeah. Uh, well, I, well, loose and stringy when I'm expecting something like tight and delicious, like filet no, yeah. yeah. And it's it's like pulled pork and it's stuck in my teeth and I can't get it out and there's no dental floss. I love a pulled pork burger. Uh, and and, awesome. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I love Charles Gray in this film. He's just, I, you know, it's such a gear shift, like from Telly Savalas to Charles Gray is like, whoa, whiplash inducing. This is a, a huge change. It's really interesting, like through all the behind the scenes stuff, there's very little information out there on like how they ended up with Charles Gray in this part because it's such like a he the actor was in You Only Live Twice obviously as a different character I assume he must have been a friend of the Broccoli's and 
they were paying Connery so much to come back for this that maybe they didn't have the money for a more high profile name in the part, maybe. Um, but I, I, I read in uh, actually in Some Kind of Hero, um, which is a really great book, AJ Chowdhury, yeah. Matthew Field. Um, they have they uh, they have a little paragraph on him there where I think it was Tom Mankiewicz who said to Charles Gray that. Okay, Blofeld is Hedda Hopper. I don't know if you know that name, like an old school Hollywood gossip columnist from like the 50s and 60s. And he was like, that's who Blofeld is. And that explains so much about this performance because he's not even trying to be menacing or threatening. There's like one scene where he's like at the desk and he's like, he's got a bit of a bullish face and he's like kind of um, towards Bond, but never feel like he's a physical threat. Never feel like we're supposed to think of him as a physical threat. And even when he's talking about, though I do really like it when he's talking about where the laser's pointing and he has the line about, oh, it's over Kansas. Well, if we, if we blow that up, no one will notice for like two weeks or whatever, which I like. I think him combined with this script is pure gold for me or diamonds perhaps if you'll forgive the pun uh i i just think that charles gray has such a a camp dry delivery that he just fits in with the rest of the vibe so well um i he's one of my favorite things in this i just absolutely love okay. him in the debate this. going now We're i know back. the fact that we, the fact we have a scene where there's like you know two charles gray two charles two, two charles grays in one scene is just like music to my ears it's uh I, I could have just had an hour of that i love it but the amount of training that that one replicant had to go under and he gets dispatched and the other blowfeld guy's like yeah all right you know whatever you know a billion yeah. dollars and research and funding and but th but even at the end like his dispatch is like a sub on a on a crane it's like one of those toy cranes you have in the video games like Meh. and he's being bumped a lot and yeah. it eventually just blows up and it's like that's the way it's dispatched and by the way i'm ruined and maybe you are too because i've read so many you know mark edlitz type books and, mm. and aj chowdhury type books where i know the treatments of what they were going to do you know having big fight out scenes in salt mines and a sub chase with another sub in a car that goes underwater and um, that it wasn't going to be Charles Gray. It was going to be Gert Frobe and it was going to be the mm. twin of Goldfinger. And I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, like that would have been so smart and interesting. But then it, to your point, it wouldn't be diamonds. It would have been gold is forever or whatever weird yeah. thing. Yeah, interesting. That would have been really weird if they'd have gone down the whole twin brother route. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I agree. It's a disappointing um, exit for that character, particularly when he doesn't come back until Theorize Eyes only, you know, really. In the, so, you know, I, I can only think the audiences were left for 10 years, like with Blofeld. Like, so did he die then or didn't he? We didn't see him blow up or we didn't see a corpse. So yeah. um, I, I think the only satisfying death this is going to sound so morbid. It's a new, a new excerpt in your videos. The most satisfying death in the film <laughs> was was Kid. I mean, it's so violent, mm. and shocking, and 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 again, watching you know Wint see his lover burn up. I mean, it's just mm. like whoa. Um, but then you get the silliness of the woo, and then <laughs> you've got Blofeld and you've got Bambi and Thumper who are all you need to do to dispatch them is hold them underwater for a little bit, bring them yeah. up, hold them underwater after they were kicking his butt. So, I mean, there's there's a couple misses in that regard of satisfaction. It is like water is their kryptonite or something. Yeah. It's like they, they, they yeah. kick them in the water. And it's like, oh, they're powerless now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like he can just hold them underwater. Very strange. I do want to pick up on something that you said as well, because it did occur to me about the plot, um, specifically with how it, it doesn't feel like it is a big, important specter. It doesn't feel like Thunderball or You Only Live Twice, even though I think arguably on paper, it is that. Like, it's he has this giant laser that he can use to just destroy entire cities, uh, nations, entire defenses, missiles can be exploded, all that kind of thing. Like, that's really big, high-stakes stuff, and we see some examples of it. And yet... I never feel like this film has a particularly grand uh, or global worldview like so many other Bond films do when they have these world domination plots. Spy Who Loved Me, Moonraker, for instance, as well. Even, you know, the climax, like the, the oil rig base is really cool. There's a lot of explosions happening and 
you know, there's a whole private army here that's being gunned down, not dissimilar to the ending of Majesties, which feels similarly epic. Yeah. Um, but in Diamonds, I, I don't feel that epicness. I don't know. Everything feels really small scale, even though technically and on paper, it should be big and grand. But I, yeah, I, I don't feel that. I I feel the same way, but I, I always took away the fact that it feels that way to me because the movie itself feels or looks a little cheap. It, mm. it, it looks like a little bit like a James Bond television special from the seventies mm. uh, versus honor majesty secret service feels theatrical. It looks theatrical. Even I will say this and we haven't mentioned this yet. I feel John Barry's music is very good at times here, but it's uneven. Here's my uneven term again. Um, there are sometimes like the, the moon buggy chase where it's like, and then you've got this like grandiose music, which is like, so John Barry. And I know he's trying to tell, a silly story he's not mm. trying to you know, it's not rocket ships eating other rocket ships in this movie <laughs> but i do feel like even the john barry music has a certain tv quality to it at times mm. it, it's like the love boat of james bond films this thing Ooh. so it, it's not it doesn't feel that richness that i would get that that's a good yeah way of describing it the love boat of bond films i quite like that and i do agree i think like some of the like i don't know if barry is just playing into the whole vegas setting cuz some of the music the -na 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 -na, like all when he's uh, landing in uh, in vegas like i i kind of like it as like background music like i do actually listen to the soundtrack for this film quite a bit and i yeah. love the title song like that's just you know a wonderful oh. piece of music but yes. yeah um, can we talk just a little bit about Vegas as a setting in general? Um, because yeah. I, I, you, you've been to Vegas, haven't you? Many, many times. Yeah. Do you like it? Oh God, no, no, <laughs> no. And I have friends that live there too. Um, <laughs> it's I actually had more fun a couple of years ago going to Old Vegas. The Old Vegas is now covered by a mall. You could do zip lines, but it, it had the cowboy that old Vegas oh, as wow. opposed to the new Vegas is, is awful. I, I mean, awful, but Vegas was never great. Even when I, I visited there as a young executive, it was just this place that, you know, felt slimy, small, dirty. Um, I remember going to circus circus and just getting a series of cards. Unfortunately. Yeah. Here's a circus circus card from circus circus. And then I, I, I changed it to make it, read this amazing but that's that's a geek that's a bond geek but <laughs> i will say the vegas stuff is just i don't know it, it maybe that's also the feeling of the 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 griminess of this film is is because it's vegas it's not it's not jamaica and it's not the bahamas it's not this lush erotic life it's a little downturned i i, I completely agree yeah i mean i think it suits this film to a t like it, it yeah. yeah I, I don't know if they constructed the rest of the feel of the thing around the fact that they knew it was going to be in Vegas or what, but it 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 is you know I, I think we're probably quite similar on the, here. Uh, I've only been twice. Uh, once was as like a seventeen year old. So what good is Vegas to someone who can't drink or gamble, oh, yeah. right? You know legally. Um, and then I did. I was there not that long ago. Um, and you know I like I like nature. <laughs> I like uh, you know history old towns things like that and you don't really have any of that in vegas it is i'm not a gambler so that yeah. it's you know the, the main pastime there is completely lost on me um so it's, it's almost like a place uh this is uh our vegas audience is gonna love us yeah um, i know <laughs> but i tend to feel or equate and i'm sure it's wrong because i've seen the outskirts of vegas which are beautiful but it mm. feels like it's almost like a land of lost souls Vegas. Mm. They're, they're kind of lost. They they think they can be found. Um, but this griminess that I'm I'm always getting from Vegas is just so apparent. It's very grubby. It's yeah. uh yeah. Um, you know, just smoking inside. Like that was such a weird like novelty, I guess, for some people. But for me, it was sort of like I'm on the casino floor and it just feels all a little bit 
grubby and I can't tell what time of day it is because there's no windows. It's, yeah, it's it's strange. And it's weird seeing how much it's changed since Diamonds Are Forever. This film is, you oh, know, yeah. over 50 years old at this point. Um, and yeah, I guess the old Vegas, like, would you call it the old town? Old towns are usually sort of like 500 years old rather than 50 years old. But yeah. that's kind of... You do call it old Vegas, yeah. Yeah. Because that's kind of what you see. Like a load yeah. of the the car chase is pretty much filmed on you know one or two strips. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that car chase? Actually, um, I I like it. I like huh. it only because you know there are so many things with the Fast and Furious where it's CGI'd and that was all done for real. And you know I think that if we compare it to the fast paced editing of today, car chases mm. things like that. Um, but I think the reason I love that so much is that is the one scene I remember being showed with my father in a nostalgic way and then pretending with Matchbox and Hot Wheels cars afterwards, oh. you know, the whole, you know, Chucky, Healy and all this type of stuff. And so it took my imagination from the film to playing with vehicles and recreating that as a child. So that scene, unfortunately, can can do no bad. Oh, that's lovely. That's so nice. I, I think we're diverging here again, though, because I really don't like it. It's, no, uh, that's fine. I, I think but it's. Don't you um, like about it? I think it's uh, like the car stuff is good. Like I think the stunts, but it is a lot to do with the filming and editing. Like I think you know, there's one shot that goes on for so long, and I get that it's part of the gag that it's a parking lot and Bond zipping around and other cars are trying to come out. But the camera is just like so high up, just like mm -hmm. looking down. It just holds for so long, and I'm like, I want to get into this i want to feel this like this is a as much as i don't think that any of the action in this film is particularly exhilarating that is a sequence where i'm kind of like i feel like i should be you know yeah. my pulse should be quickening a bit here and it just isn't which is um which is a shame i think yeah it's and the other thing is too is the comparative so if you take this film as the only bond film pre pretend for a second this is the only bond film um, that car chase stands out against a moon buggy chase, mm. a moon buggy chase where cars, the bad guy cars, if they only drive straight, they're going to fall into a ditch. Or if they drive their, you know, ATV three wheelers, they're going to go into a ditch. So there's there's nothing, um, I don't know, antagonistic or violent about it. It's just mm. a moon buggy easily escaping these people. So this this movie kind of for me is missing that big action scene that kind of holds things together. That's meaningful. But instead you have these kooky things like moon buggy chases. Yeah. Yeah. The moon buggy chases. Uh, you, you wonder what was going through their minds, that whole bit where Bond is infiltrating Willard White's uh, facility and he comes across a moon landing uh, being faked. Uh, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> That was, um, it still goes on today with some things. Um, that was a controversy, I think, of the time. So I think that was their wink and nod of like everybody saying, well, you know, the moon landing was faked. And so I think it was them basically saying, it was almost like in Dr. No, when they show the painting in Dr. No's layers, that was yeah, stolen. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like, see, we're kind of crossing over between real life. And that's what I assumed. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because otherwise it's like, why is this here? This is such a strange. I guess it would have been more timely when they were putting the film together, maybe putting the film together, maybe. But um... yeah, and why would there be so much security if that was just training? I mean, that's that's why I thought it was being faked, and there was a TV camera, and yeah, I love the guy's motivation, who was like still in the motivation of an astronaut who's swinging at Bond, but in zero gravity. Yeah, he's like going in slow motion, which is like, why are you doing that? Is the suit like built so that you can't like get a good sense of motion going with this? Very strange. Um, just another, yeah, just another very strange tangent in this film. But I do love all the stuff. I think Connery really comes alive in this where he's, and he has to do it in a few places. He's having to play as another character. And when he's doing the, his whole infiltration of that bit, the Klaus Hergesheimer thing, checking radiation shields. And he's so proud when he's like holding up his, oh, please tell me you have a, do you have a radiation I shield? Oh, that's so cool. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's brilliant. I love how Bond fans, you know, everyone knows Klaus Hergesheimer. Like, you might not know Bond's other... Uh... Oh, that's so cool. I love all the all the little stuff. Even, like, you know, when they, they get his wallet and... You just killed James Bond. Yeah. Nice. 
That's what so what good. a terrible yeah. secret agent he is that they actually know who James Bond is. Is that, did I catch sight of a, a signed photo behind you as well? Is that actually... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I've got most of the players. Oh, cool. Um, uh, most of the Bond girls, etc. This is really cool. It doesn't really factor into the movie that much, but... Oh, Q, when Q's going through the, yeah, and he's gambling. Uh, ah, yeah. that's really nice. Is that custom made? Is that? It is custom made. It was actually done in honor of um, uh, Andrew, Andy House, who was a, a big Bond fan who did a lot of props. He used to love props and he always wanted to do this ring. So mm. they did a, a limited run and they actually put on the cover a little ode to him. Which oh, was that's really lovely. Sweet and lovely. Yeah. And there it is. Wow. Oh. Very impressive. <laughs> Sorry, um, we digress. So uh, just one final topic before we, um, you know, sort of leading into the wrap up on this. This is Connery's final uh, Eon produced Bond film. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever get to talk about Never Say Never Again in these videos. Maybe we will. I, we I should. Yeah, it feels like that, that maybe not the Casino Royale spoof, but Never Say Never Again, we probably should cover. Um, yeah. As a, a wrap-up to his tenure, how satisfied are you with, like, let's say, you know, the last the last scene, the last shot, how are we going to get those diamonds back from there? Him and Jill St. John looking at each other, looking up to the sky, because I, I actually really like it. I, I, I like that he, you know, dispatches the henchman in his final scene. I like the chemistry that he has with Jill St. John throughout the film, so I like that he's kind of, you know, cosy with her at the end. I, I think it's a... Uh, a nice, appropriate send-off. Uh, how do you feel? So, look at you getting, like, slower. Like, I'm reading on David's face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we may not agree. I don't think I agree with you on this, which is good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I'll tell you, there is this great... I'll try to find it for you. There's this great image that a Bond fan out there took the very last, like, image that you see of each Bond actor in their last uh -huh. film. Like, you know... Uh, Daniel Craig is blowing up in No Time to Die. You know, Timothy Dalton and License to Kill. What does he look like? And usually they're with the women and stuff like that. And it's just very interesting to see that, typically speaking, the Bond folks, whether it's Roger Moore and View to a Kill, License to Kill, I know we could argue about that, um, and Diamonds Are Forever, Connery, that they don't always end up in the best of their films, in the mm. epitome. You know, it's like, oh, what a crescendo that they're leaving on. So I think this whole idea, first of all, it's very fitting to the film, the ending, mm. you know, and then breaking into the song, I think is very nice. I also think it's very fitting for Connery's Bond in the sense that most of his films end with him with a girl looking up, reacting in a dinghy, doing something like that. So I don't think it's like, whoa, that's just so not Connery. Yeah. It's not like the Daniel Craig thing where it's like, wow, him blowing up is so not Bond. Mm. I the problem that I have with it is that it's sad to me. It's a mm. little sad because oh. um, Diamonds Are Forever for me, I don't know if I would rate it as low as I did when I did my ranking. It would probably creep up mm. in the rankings by a few. I mean, not significantly, not up to 16 or 13. Um, but because of that, it makes me a little sad that that's the way he ends his official tenure. You know, he doesn't end on... Uh, yeah, a fr a from Russia with Love or a Thunderball mm. or a Goldfinger or a Dr. No. He, he ends on Diamonds of Forever, which it's almost like, I'll give you the analogy. It's almost like your child who's an absolute prodigy at the piano and they go up for the recital and they hit all the wrong notes. And it's like, oh. no, you did so good at home. <laughs> you know, the whole week that you were practicing was beautiful. And then you hit that dinger of a note. And so you you feel... I mean, we have to. We're huge Bond fans. We feel like these are our children. So when our children mm -hmm. don't perform to their best ability, you tend to feel a little bit sad and you feel sad for them. So I feel sort of bad for Connery, too, that that was like he's he's ending on a very controversial, divisive movie, as we've seen today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's 
because I, I was going to ask if this had, would potentially, you know, creep up your rankings a little bit or based on your, uh, yeah, I know <laughs> I, I was, I was, I, I forgot I become outraged every time I go back and, you know, rewatch that video when it's like, it, you know, Diamonds Are Forever is down there with Moonraker and Octopussy and like all the films that I love. But um, can I tell yeah. you something though, too, because I yeah. know we've already done these movies, Octopussy and Moonraker would have, are now definitely creeping up higher. Yes, <laughs> they really are. And and I think I would I need to do a new ranking this year because I think mm. people would be surprised of the more recent movies that have crept down. For mm. me. Yeah. Or I, I, and I and I a lot of it is maybe you taught me this. A lot of it is, is that I'm appreciating Bond movies that are just more fun mm. that are escapism because of this drought. And I'm just going to say it, please. I'm not trying to be a negative Nelly here. Uh, a negative little Nelly. I'm <laughs> I'm thinking that the next Bond film we get, whatever iteration it is, is not going to be like anything that we've had in Diamonds Are Forever, Moonraker mm. or not. They're not going to be anything like that. So I'm now going back and thinking finally like, oh, we'll never have you. Yeah. Aww. You know, we'll, we'll have a different version and I'm sure we can appreciate and love that version. But we're never going to have movies like Octopussy again. We're mm. never going to have a Moonraker again. Never. Mm. In fact, I've got to say, Johnny English 4 was just announced. I know. What I thought was genius was they said this movie, in the, in the kind of the press release, this movie is going to be more Bond than James Bond. Nah. And I know what that means. Yeah. That means there's going to be that, you know, innuendo. And there's going to be off-putting things and it's not going to be politically correct. And there's going to be crazy violence. And I don't know if that's the way of Bond anymore. So I look back on these films and they are creeping up my ranking because of that. That's really interesting because I, I do agree with you as well. They do become more and more like special and precious as the years go on because you do sort of think like, oh God, we'll never have a film like this again. A Bond film will never. And particularly, I think when it comes to Diamonds Are Forever, which is such a oddball outlier of the series anyway just like you know with people willard white is a character who would never appear in like more than half the bond films it's such a weird little thing and i think that's what i appreciate the most about diamonds it has gone up and down my rankings over the years as well um now i'm really in a place with it where it's like I'm good. I know that this is a comedy. I know that this is not a gritty spy revenge thriller, and I'm okay with that. I can take from it all of the pleasure that I get from Charles Gray, from Winton Kidd, from Tiffany Case, all of that campiness, all of that grimy, gritty Las Vegas dirtiness that makes me want to have a shower immediately after I watch the film, but I still kind of go with it and enjoy it anyway. Um, and, and yeah, we will never have another film like diamonds are forever so that's oh that's so sad I, I know god that's a bit of a pessimistic note to end on but hey david we've got more films to talk about coming up uh so Dude. yeah we're going to be on your channel next uh yes yeah, so what have to... what haven't we done i know that there's a list for the, I I went through the videos just before this to oh. uh pick them out so we we've never talked about goldfinger we've, what i know right like that's a pretty big one. Uh, and I think that's going to actually be a full-on debate, by the way. Oh, I really? See... Oh, yes. Oh, interesting. And by okay. the way, that's it. You could. I mean, I want to hear the others, but we got to stop right there. We're in the 60th year anniversary of Goldfinger. We have to have that as the next movie. Well, we do have another anniversary movie on this list as well. Man with the Golden Gun. We've never talked about that. There's no debate there. I know how we both <laughs> feel about that movie. But go ahead. Uh, we also have Live and Let Die, which I know is a big movie for you. We uh, haven't talked about that yet? No, no. Oh. I know, crazy, isn't it? Uh, Spy Who Loved Me. We've got like these three first Roger movies, uh, which we never uh, talked about. I feel, is... I feel like if we're being true to who we are and who our channels are, I feel like the next one should be Goldfinger. Yes. I'll host that one. And then you should definitely host The Man with the Golden Gun. I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah, right. that's, yeah, 100%. Uh, and then we actually have three Craig films after that. Casino Royale, Skyfall, Spectre. Um, we've not talked about, so. What? We haven't I know, done... it's crazy, isn't it? I thought, honestly, I hand on heart, I thought we did every one of the Craig films already. 
No, no. Um, yeah, it's just no time no. to die. And uh, oh, we've got a Libya. busy year. We've got a busy year, you and I. I know, right? This, 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 this there's more on this list than I thought there would be. And of course, never say never again. And the Casino Royale spoof. If we you know. <laughs> and yeah, well, it's a never say never again type of year too. All right, yeah. but um, I think you know. Calvin Dyson and David Zeritsky will return in Goldfinger if that's cool with you. 100%. Yeah, let's do it. It has right. to be. It has to be this year. <laughs> let's do it. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me, David. As always, this has been an awful lot of fun. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing so many of your props. It always gets my jaw dropping, the 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 kind of stuff that you have. I just, yeah, love it. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for maybe making me not use this on you. Appreciate that. <laughs> See you next time, David. Cheers. Bye.